Welcome to the Information Management 360 podcast, brought to you by Archive 360, the industry experts in information management for the digital age. The Information Management 360 podcast delivers thoughtful conversations about compliance, records management, data security, e-discovery, and much more, so you can learn how to better manage and protect your data in the cloud. So let's get started. Welcome to the Information Management 360 podcast. This week's episode is titled The Changing Information Governance Environment in the Age of COVID-19. My name is Bill Tolson, and I'm the Vice President of Compliance and e-discovery at Archive 360. With me today is Mike Salvareza, Vice President of Content Development for MER. Today, Mike and I will be discussing the issues with uh, this changing information governance environment and how the pandemic is, and the reemergence of the pandemic is really uh, forcing us to look at different ways to address information governance. So maintaining an an effective information governance program in this kind of environment that we've all been experiencing for a year and a half or more, really, which has been pushing most organizations into a remote workforce environment, again, due to the pandemic and those issues that I'm sure that most people by now have run into. I know, Mike, you have some some great insights into this. So the dramatic rise in the COVID-19, especially the Delta variant, has begun to push us all back into social distancing, mask wearing, and a halt to the return to the office environment. And I know many, many people that I'm in contact with, some of them were in the process of actually beginning the move back at least part-time to their office environments. And almost all of them have told me that has stopped yet again. This ongoing remote work environment continues to put a strain on long-established corporate information governance processes. This potentially I hate to say it, but maybe potentially permanent shift to a partial or at least full remote work environment highlights the need to rethink corporate information governance processes, technologies, and and strategies that organizations are looking to or may need to update change because of this. And I know a lot of us early on, or not even early on, you know, a year into the the last shutdown, we're expecting it wasn't going to last uh, much longer, and it continues to, uh, at least in certain parts of the company, to hang on. So with, with that in mind, let's, let's dive into our discussion. So Mike, you and I have spoken briefly about the need to reimagine information governance. Can you explain what you mean by this reimagination? Sure. And Bill, uh, before I answer that, um, thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. It's a, it's a pleasure to speak with you and it's a, it's a pleasure to be on this podcast. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Mike. I think that information governance is a discipline that is still trying to, in some ways, figure out what it's all about, figure out, you know, how you actually define, uh, what, what that role is within an organization. And there's a lot to talk about there. But if we accept for a moment that the at the very broadest, highest level description of what information governance is, that it is the management of information through its entire life cycle in, in an organization with all of the various concerns that apply to that information, whether it's privacy or whether it's an e-discovery imperative or whatever it is that touches that information. Information governance is responsible for making sure that that information is managed and governed throughout its life cycle. If you accept that as the definition, you might say, well, sure, that sounds pretty clear and that sounds pretty comprehensive. What what does reimagining it mean? Well, I think reimagining information governance has a lot to do with not not so much what I just said, the charter of information governance, but but what it's really endeavoring to do and how it's endeavoring to do it. So an example is this COVID situation. It is this remote working situation that we're all struggling with, but there are others. But if we look at the remote office situation, there are challenges that, that have emerged. And I think these, some of these are fundamental challenges. They, they have to do with 
a complete shift in how the workforce works together, how they collaborate, how they exchange information, where that information resides, how that information can be secured, how that information can be collected and preserved. It becomes exponentially more difficult when the organization is very much dispersed. And it becomes much more difficult when the dispersed organization is starting to use technologies that, if we roll back the clock just a couple of years, were new and novel, but now are kind of commonplace. Things like Microsoft Teams and things like Zoom. All of those platforms are now essential business tools. Some of them create real challenges for information governance. So when I say reimagining information governance, it's really about how does information governance, how do information governance professionals once and for all really tackle these problems because the problems of burgeoning piles of information have been around for quite a long time, and I'm not sure we have completely solved those problems. But now is an opportunity to really rethink how we're doing all of this and rethink what we're trying to do. You know, that, that's 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 a great a great insight. And and you know, you you mentioned information governance professionals. I connect that with records managers and, and others as well. And and you mentioned these new technologies that were very quickly ad- adopted early last year because of the pandemic and because of the move to remote workforce. And, you know, obviously I'm thinking about Zoom and, and Teams and others like that, but the very quick adoption, and I think in many cases to organizations I've talked to, the lack of, of a complete understanding of w- how information on those platforms you know, is generated, stored, and managed. And and I know early on, and I was writing articles about this uh, early on. You know, especially with with Teams, but also with with Zoom and 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 others. You know, how how can you capture that data? Are you capturing all the data objects? Did even your IT organizations have an inkling as to how complex? you know, that would be, you know, with, with teams, for example, there are, you know, 10, 12 data objects that are created when a standard chat goes on or a meeting held within the platform, you know, there's sentiment and there's emojis and there's uploaded files and shared and private conversations and public conversations. And, you know, within the platform, those things are spread all over the place. And, and especially early on, very few organizations knew where all that stuff was being captured, for example, or, or generated within Office 365, how to capture it, how to set retention policies on it. And that's not even mentioning, you know, the, the e-discovery side. You know, if you're under litigation hold and those kinds of things, nobody knew where this data was. So that was an extremely kind of difficult situation. And I think there's still a lot of companies who who have not caught up. I know I know many of the platforms and I know Teams especially has Microsoft has made some valiant attempts to to make that data collection more straightforward, a little bit easier. They I think they got a long way to go. But I think with all of that said, with this move to a remote workforce, whether it's permanent or not, what are the challenges, issues for information governance professionals with this change? Because, you know, they, they have all kinds of responsibilities. They have, you know, their management uh, expecting that they're doing certain things and doing it correctly. And, and I've talked to many information governance professionals, and they all, you know, highlight various issues that is giving them difficulty. And one, one of the things I'll bring up later, Mike, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a chance here in a second. I'm sorry I'm rambling on. But one, one of the challenges that we can, we can potentially talk about a little bit later in the podcast is this idea of with data being generated and you're in a remote work environment, whether you're on a VPN or not, all of that data that potentially is being stored, some of it locally on, on, uh, on uh, uh, employee machines and so forth, how it makes it even more difficult to, to, number one, for the InfoGov professionals to know that this stuff is being generated, where it's at, who has access to it, and, and how do you lock it down if you need to. What do you think about that, Mike? Well, I think we could spend this entire 
podcast talking about Microsoft Teams and what strategies need to be in place to meet the challenges that it creates. But it's a good proxy for some other problems. Um, I, I think that Microsoft Teams is an example of a platform that creates or, or exacerbates the problem of data sprawl that already exists within organizations. Yeah. Even if you did not have Microsoft Teams in place, even if you did not have the remote workforce trying to figure out how to collaborate this way, you still had the problem of data sprawl in an organization, data p- being stored in different nooks and crannies of the, of the infrastructure. Microsoft Teams presents a challenge because a lot of the data storage, to your point, Bill, a lot of the things that get created during a regular usage of Teams, a regular meeting or you know what, whatever it is they're using Teams for, those things are, some of them are new data types that for organizations, a lot more video recordings and audio recordings that are, you know, as we know, a little bit more difficult to search for. But the issue of data sprawl is is really exacerbated by teams because people don't understand very clearly the underpinnings, the technologies that it is that it is riding on top of. So the the challenge is for organizations to to figure out a data management strategy that makes the the storage of information that comes out of teams more clear more clear i guess is the right word and once it's clear then we can we can start to figure out how to govern that data right now you have organizations that are running microsoft teams and they don't really have their head around a OneDrive strategy or a SharePoint strategy or whatever it is that that is underpinning their particular information, or they may not have a cloud strategy. So I think the issue with Teams is that it's it's exacerbating some of the, the problems that have already existed. The other thing with Teams is that we're in a situation where you can't stop that train. I think any information governance professional that's been around for any length of time knows that there's this constant tension between what the business wants to do and what information governance thinks they can manage. Mm -hmm. I go back, and this is where I will date myself in this, and maybe I shouldn't do that in a podcast for the whole world to hear, but, you know, go back to the times when text messaging was first emerging as as something that people wanted to to use, and I remember the 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 battles coming out of the legal department, coming out of the the uh, records management group, saying, you know, we can't allow text messaging in the organization. Well, you you can't stop that train. We didn't stop that train. Text messaging is now something that everyone does. Those battles are age old, and I think when I say reimagining IG. We have to get away from those battles. Those battles are never ours to win. The business is always going to win those battles because the business needs to move forward. And and with this pandemic and with the rate of change that has happened to accommodate the changes that were incurred because of the pandemic, the business is not going to slow down. The business has to actually accelerate. And, and information governance needs to be part of that accelerant, not an impediment to that in, that acceleration. And that's a real challenge for IG because you know you you don't want an IG organization that just rolls over and says do whatever you want. They need to figure out how to be part of the business, part of an enabler of the business, while ensuring that things are governed the right way. But you can't turn around and say stop. Don't implement teams. I was part of a discussion not too long ago with an organization that was debating whether or not to allow third parties or outside people to participate in teams meetings. And the concern was the the discussion of sensitive information with third parties over teams and, and the inability to manage what happens to some elements of that information as it goes out into a third party's organization. And yeah. the, the, the desire to shut down access to third parties was very strong on some people's parts. 
And that battle lasted all of about five minutes before it was clear that that battle was, was not to be won. My point is, I'm being a little long-winded, but my point is IG needs to get on the, on the bandwagon of helping the business. And, and in order to do that, we really have to understand these technologies, not fight them. We really need to understand them. We need to understand them quickly, and we need to be part of putting a strategy in place that helps those, those technologies come to life in an organization while we're able to govern the information that they generate. Obviously, great great points there. You mentioned uh, uh, data spall. Just falling back on a, a story, I, I always remember kind of related to that. And this was probably six, seven, eight years ago. I was part of a e discovery meeting where opposing counsel was was you know kind of questioning various people within a company. The two companies were suing each other over I think it was patent infringement. And uh, the opposing counsel was asking the VP of accounting, does your department, do your employees utilize any kind of, for example, instant messaging? And before the, the VP of accounting could answer, the, the company's lawyer, I think it was actually the GC, basically piped up and said, no, that, that's impossible. We, we have a rule that basically says that instant messaging and other types of that kind of collaboration application uh, cannot be used within the company. And even before he actually ended his sentence, the VP of accounting kind of sheepishly said, well, yes, many of them use Yahoo Instant Messenger. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, the GC just kind of look, looked at the VP of accounting and, you know, with an extremely dissatisfied face. And when asked how that was possible, she says the only way we can get stuff done in our, in our schedule. So, yeah, many, many of the people have, have installed their own Yahoo Instant Messenger within the company's uh, enterprise and they use it all the time. And the next question from the opposing counsel was, did you place a litigation hold on, did you start collecting all that data? <laughs> and the answer was no, uh, obviously. So that that caused some question. That caused some issues, obviously, going on for a long time to come. But you know, I think you get you also, Mike, you get into the, the whole idea of of human nature. Humans are going to kind of move toward those those solutions that benefit them in their daily working uh, environment, unless you know there is an ongoing enforcement of those things with with actual punitive uh, results, employees are going are, are gonna to do what they're going to do. And, and it's up to IT and it's up to, to legal and it's up to the InfoGov people to, to know what's, what's being used and why and uh, adapt to that so that you can, you know, capture that data in, in archiving if, if, you know, you should or, you know, if you can apply litigation holds on, on those things. I think especially with information governance, people working with IT and and, and legal, you know, they, sh- they should all be co-equals in figuring out what those processes, technologies, and so forth should be. I mean, I, w- one of the things, and, and again, going back to the data it's a problem, I, we, we deal, Archive 360 deals with a, a lot of large state and federal agencies. And uh, with both of those, uh, with the move to mostly remote workforces, the issue of responding to Freedom of Information Act requests have become much more difficult. We've had many, many, many federal agencies as well as state agencies uh, coming to us saying how, you know, we data is all over the place now. It's not just sitting in the enterprise. It's not sitting on just the email server that one of our people can go in and do a search on. It's all over the place. And what do we do? If you can't respond to a for you request within the law's stated time, then some of those FOIA requests are going to turn into litigation. And we're seeing a lot of that too. So that that idea, this, the whole idea of the workforce, uh, you know, remote workforce is is almost the definition of data sprawl in that data is just, just everywhere now. And it's very difficult for, especially many of these, these agencies don't have the biggest IT budgets in the world, so uh, it's always secondary or, or a third uh, level priority to actually get control of their information. But uh, it, it's been, you know, the whole idea of, of you bringing up my data sprawl is is kind of the crux of of the problem. What data 
should be managed with the current circumstances, how can it be managed? And again, I know, I, I think we've talked about this before, and I might have mentioned it like five minutes ago, but the, the idea of what data within an organization, even, even with the remote workforce out the window, what data should be actively managed by information governance professionals? Is it only records or is it all the data? And, and how do you do that? Yeah. So I'll leave the how do you do that to you, Bill, <laughs> and, and your company. But my feeling on this is, is this. I think that there are reasons there are certain there are certain reasons why you want to pay attention to formal records in your organization and uh, so you have to manage those formal records and those formal records as we all know are a limited very limited subset of of all the information in an organization and we all know that when it comes to e-discovery the universe of applicable information suddenly becomes everything so it really to answer your question, I think it the context matters in terms of what it is you should be managing and governing. And I think that you need to manage it all because you can't predict what that context is. It could be a privacy request coming in from the EU for some piece of data in somebody's email somewhere. Uh, it could be a, a FOIA request, as you said. It could be a, 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 a tax audit. It could be it be, could be something as formal as that, or something as informal as we're doing discovery for an anticipated litigation about the firing of an employee and what was said between these two people over here about that employee. So I think you have to manage all of it. the The how to do that is the challenge, and and so when I think about reimagining information governance, I think we have to get quickly away from. Any notion, any notion that we think that people can do this, I think we have to quickly get away, certainly get away from the notion that the employees, the workforce should be tasked with managing their records or managing their information according to whatever governance constraints we want to put in place. They need to do their jobs. They need to do their business. They don't wake up in the morning to be a records manager. They wake up in the morning to be a sales executive or whatever it is their role is. And I don't think it's humanly possible to manage the volumes of data. And now with the pandemic and the new collaboration platforms, I don't think it's humanly possible to manage the rapidly evolving sources of information that leads me to technology that leads me to things like machine learning and artificial intelligence engines so when i think of information governance in the future i think information governance will largely res rest on the abilities of these engines to do these governance functions because i i don't believe that it's humanly possible to achieve all the things that we need to achieve manually. Yeah, absolutely agree with you on that. I've been looking at this very specific topic for you know, decades now. Um, and one of the biggest issues that I've seen in the idea of managing all data, not just the 5 or 10% that happens to be records, is is cultural in a lot of cases. You know, you walk into high-tech companies and, uh, in, and when I was consulting and going in and talking to companies in general about, you know, how did, how did they manage your information? Did they have records policies? How did they capture data and so forth? Um, the, the, in many cases, and it's still this case because I still, I still ask about it, is this idea that the organization that I'm talking to at the time basically looks at all of that data that, that an end user receives and creates and uses and shares as kind of their own personal data. And, you know, sure, there are records that, because of compliance reasons, have to be captured and protected and all kinds of other stuff. But all of that other stuff, that's the employee's issue. And, and whether, you know, they think it raises uh, rises to the need to keep or delete or whatever is all on the employee. In fact, I've never been in a company that, that has even brought up the subject of Gee, all that information. And, I, and I've written articles on the idea that, you know, it, companies employ 
people to create and ingest information. And that information is then used to create products and, and design new things and all kinds of neat stuff. But very few companies actually attempt to to even know what information their employees have. And like you said, it was a great point. With all the new privacy regulations, um, you know, if I'll just throw a number out there, if 80% of all of the data, all the electronic data in an organization is maintained and controlled directly by individual employees, then if you get a right to be forgotten request, how do you know what the employees have on their own individual laptops? If you don't have access to those laptops, if they're not syncing and you can search them and all those kinds of things, the ability to ensure that you've uh, carried out the right to be forgotten request is impossible. And, and if you can't do it, by the way, the potential fines can, can be large, can be huge. But the idea of, of I, I think, like you say, all of that data that, that employees control, companies need to change their overall cultural understanding of that. It's their data. You know, I, I shouldn't be sitting on three terabytes of data that the company knows nothing about. It should be synced via the enterprise and so forth. And then, like you say, it, it's it's physically, I think, impossible, like like you did say, for, for an individual employee to deal with, you know, 50, 200, 500 gigabytes or megabytes of, of data on a daily basis. And what do we do with it? And that's where I, I think the only potential solution, and you mentioned this is the idea of of machine learning and, and AI to look at that. But the first step is to, is to say we need to set up mechanisms that gives the enterprise the ability to collect that data and, and number one, know what's there and be able to manage it, apply retention policies on it, be, a play, be able to apply litigation holds and, and you know, set those, those systems in place that at least allow that connection so you know you can, you, you can get to that data and then rely on machine learning and AI to, to go out and, and index that data, understand that data, apply, you know, retention disposition on it, you know, uh, all kinds of neat things. And I think that that is the, the only possible solution once those organizations get to that point where they say, yes, we have to manage it all. Uh, not, not, not just those odd records that, you know, the, that some agency is going to threaten us over, but everything. Right. Uh, because with the privacy regulations and various other regulations, uh, companies are in, in huge jeopardy if they're not going to manage that data. I think that's right. And, you know, I want to be clear, you know, a lot of times people that I talk to, you know, at, at the MER, of course, we are, we are a conference and an, and an organization focused on bringing content around this to the to the to the audience that we deal with and and so whether it's webinars or the conference or other things so we talk with a, a lot of people and there's often a, uh, uh, what I've seen is a concern especially from people that are traditional records managers or people who have grown up in that space feeling as if you know the records management discipline is no longer necessary or feeling like they don't have a place or not underst understanding what their role is vis-a-vis -vis information governance. And, and I, I think that everything that you just said, Bill, is correct. Everything that I said is how I feel. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a very important role for the records manager. It's just, it's just that the records manager needs to think bigger. It's, it's not about just securing these one or two documents that relate to this one particular regulation. It's about helping the organization understand where all of its data is. And again, I think, I think automated tools are the only way to do that. And, and to help derive value from all of that data. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of good stuff in there. One, one, one very short story, probably five years ago, six years ago at, at the most, uh, while consulting, we were, I, I was in a, a, a lo very large organization and we were having a meeting with the legal department, the records department and IT. And there were probably 30 people in the room, you know, the VP of records was there, the GC and all his staff were there, you know, IT and all that kind of stuff. And uh, they proceeded, uh, the, the IT and GC started 
and legal folks started proceeded to start complaining about, you know, that that darn you know file server that everybody knew about that had 700 terabytes worth of data on it, and the fact that nothing on it was being managed, so that every time an e-discovery request came in, they had to go through and, and research it. Uh, and they were paying, you know, consultants to do that, and and it was costing them millions of dollars per year because they never got to the point of actually managing the data. And and both both the the, the legal department and the IT department kind of looked at the VP of records and said, well, why don't you have control of this? And uh, the VP of records kind of looked at everybody and and said, we we don't have any any say so over over the data on file servers and so forth, and you know the the room kind of kind of got got loud and said, "Well, why not?" And and the VP of records said, "Basically, we've put out a directive that have told everybody in the organization that records cannot be stored on file servers. They have to go into the into the records management system. Therefore, there's nothing on those 700 terabytes that has anything to do with records. So we don't have any say so over it." <laughs> and and the obviously the meeting got very loud after that and but but that was and I'm not blaming the records people that that was part of the organizational kind of culture that you know they put out a directive and say do not put records on that and records management only cares about records therefore all this other stuff is none of our business and and we don't care and I have noticed not that specific organization but I've noticed that's that's slightly changed I think that is changing, and and, and yeah. yeah, and I think that, but that's a very good story and a very good example of that sort of limiting thinking on both sides, right? I think to to go back to your story, the organization defined that only records go in the record system, and that's all we care about. Yeah, the records manager then went along with that, and I think the records manager needs to, and this is where information governance. I I'm not trying to conflate the two, but information governance needs to essentially take a leadership role to say, no, that's not really sufficient. Yeah, no, it, that, absolutely. I absolutely agree with you. Progressing from, you know, the old, well, I hate to say old, but, but you know, the dated records management kind of category of professionals to more of an information governance and everything else that equates brings up you know, kind of another question, and it's, this relates back to the whole idea of remote workforce as, as well, but with cyber threats and ransomware and extortionware and all, all of this stuff going nuts, it's putting more of a security, both, both infrastructure and data security requirement on organizations. And, you know, information governance professionals are, are working by, by definition of what they're supposed to be doing with a lot of this data. So personally, I think it's, it's, it's realistic and probably required for InfoGov professionals to become, I wouldn't say much more knowledgeable, but more knowledgeable on data security because they're going to be working with it and, and, and interfacing with it on a, on a daily basis. What do you think about the need for InfoGov professionals to, to be coming up the learning curve more on overall infrastructure and data security. Let me answer that with an analogy or at first, and then I'll get a little bit more deeper. I think the best analogy to view what an information governance director, chief information governance officer, whatever title you want to give that person is, is they, they are very much akin to the conductor of an orchestra. They don't necessarily need to know how to play the violin or the oboe, but they need to extract the best from the violin and from the oboe, and they need to know when those two instruments need to play whatever it is they need to play to produce the symphony. In the world of information governance, I think cybersecurity is fast becoming the most significant threat, the most significant concern even more than privacy. I think privacy is is there today, um, mm-hmm. but I think it's now even moving past that. It's, it's cybersecurity. For an information governance professional to be successful, that person needs to understand why cybersecurity is important, needs to understand at a higher level what, what a cybersecurity program should look like, 
and needs to be able to integrate that into the overall information governance program. Doesn't mean that they need to know how to go down and sit down in the data center and configure a firewall, but they need to know what a firewall is. And they need to know, they need to know how to create and work with uh, cybersecurity professionals to create a policy structure that articulates a secure environment. Do you grant access based on the on the principle of least privilege? You know, least privilege. Do you, mm-hmm. you know how do you deal with third parties? Do you shut down the USB drives on on laptops through policy? There are things that that have to happen, and in order for an information governance professional to make sure that the information that they are looking after is secured. They need to have a very tight relationship with the cybersecurity people in their organization because the information governance professional is not a cybersecurity expert. The information security person is. So they need to be able to forge a relationship and grab that person and make them part of the program. That's how I see it. That's an excellent point. And, and you know, for, for information governance people, they need to you know, come up to speed with and understand the use of specific data masking. Gee, you know, bank numbers within any document are going to be masked, anonymized, pseudo-anonymized, encrypted, whatever it happens to be, because, number one, because of the privacy implications and so forth. But, you know, who in the company, who in the information governance department needs to be able to see that stuff? And, and who doesn't? You know, there are very few people in a company that, you know, out, outside of maybe accounting that, that needs to see bank numbers or credit card numbers or anything like that. But that stuff is all over information floating around in organizations. And as we talked about machine learning and AI, systems will start or now have already started, uh, you know, recognizing and masking that stuff. So, you know, information Governance professionals, information governance employees, you know, the people in that department are, are, are basically having to deal with sensitive data or at least, at least work with files with sensitive data in it now on a daily basis, especially with the, with the privacy regulations. Who, you know, the VP of information governance or whatever title they're using they need to have input is as to who in their department needs to be able to see that sensitive information because with with the adoption of machine learning and and AI, you know, systems now are automatically going to be recognizing that data, that sensitive data within any document, email, chat, whatever it happens to be, and and uh, masking that, uh, running data masking routines on it, anonymizing it. Uh, encrypting it, whatever, and and nowadays, along with that system capability to recognize that data and mask it, there's also the need to have things like we've we've talked about role based access controls. Who within the organization will the system automatically unmask that data for them to see? And it now needs to be done automatically. It needs to be done in the background as I pull up a file that I need to work with, you know, it needs to know, you know, do, should I have access to that sensitive data and then automatically demask it. And that is becoming, again, with those, with the privacy regulations and the huge fines and with cyber and ransomware and extortionware and all that kind of stuff, you know, we've moved from the need to do infrastructure or enterprise security, gee, I'm going to work like, like crazy to make sure that the wrong people don't get in the system. But after that, yeah, they have access to everything. That, that's gone by the wayside. That can't happen anymore with, you know, the, the uh, Capital One, you know, AWS, you know, privilege escalation attack of last year with the phishing attempts, you know, that, that you know, you send an email to any employee and, and if they click on the wrong link, you just basically bypass all of your enterprise security. So getting down into individual file data security, I think, is is the next frontier that we're all uh, starting to work on and offer. And that gets back to, uh, you know, does, uh, does Mike, should Mike have access to sensitive data when he pulls up a file? Should Bill not have access to it? And that needs to be done 
uh, automatically and very, very quickly. Because again, uh, like we both said, you know, over, over, you know, the talk we've been having that there is so much data now uh, that it's humanly impossible for anybody to, to work on this stuff individually, whether you're IT or, or an individual employee. So it, it needs to be pretty much, you know, bulletproof, but it needs to be automatic and very, very, very fast. Um, and that's why, you know, based on the original question of do, do information governance professionals need to be coming up uh, more to speed, and not that they're not, by the way, I know many of them are, on, on the idea of at least the principles of security and hopefully in many organizations, if not all organizations, are they working with the security people? Are they working with IT to make sure that, number one, the right technologies are being employed, but also the right authorizations are being included in this stuff as well. I think, I think there's all, all of that is, is absolutely spot on. And I, I would agree with all of it. And I, again, back to the, the theme that you put out for the, this podcast of reimagining IG, you know, there's, there's even more to it than that. And some of it is less technical than what you're, what you're suggesting. So, you know, on the subject of phishing, as an example, phishing that these phishing attacks have become so sophisticated. It's really hard. It's really hard to not click because it really looks, it looks bona fide. It looks inviting, whatever it may be. So what's the degree of education that IG is putting out there to the organization around phishing? You know, you can run mock phishing exercises across your organization. You can put in, 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 put in a training infrastructure that sends out a mock phishing attack and you can track who fell for it and then they can get remedial training. There's a lot that you can do that's not even technical that, that will, will, will go a long ways towards, towards strengthening your, your posture as an organization. And this is where I think IG has, has a role. When I say reimagining IG, it's not just how do I manage that record or how do I mask that information? It's all of it. It's, and it goes to education. How do you lead the organization in a way that helps build a culture of security and a, and a, and a culture of governance? Well, the information governance professional can do that in, in a number of ways. Training and communication is a part of it. And that, that requires uh, some leadership. Yeah, great, great point. And, and the idea of ongoing training is, is very important. We do that. In fact, it was, I wouldn't say funny. It was actually disturbing. I was, I was going through a, a, uh, fishing, uh, training course. I think it was last week or beginning of this week. And as I was actually going through and taking the quizzes and stuff, I got an email from my VPN provider that I do on my own personally. And uh, it basically said, gee, we're, we're really sorry, but your auto renewal has been, you know, damaged and you need to re-put in your, your credit card number. And it's like, okay, sure. First thing I did was look at the URL, look at the, look at the email URL. And it was actually from, they, they had mimicked that. Usually, you know, you could tell very quickly if the, if the email is some weird email address with a dot Gmail at the end, obviously it didn't come from that. But this, this was very well done. Not that I'm talking them up, but even worse, two hours later, I got another email from supposedly this VPN provider saying, hey, we're sorry. We don't know what happened. That wasn't us. But to make things right, we're going to give you a discount, but you need to re-put your credit card number back into the system. <laughs> and it was like, wow, these guys are really working for it. It was almost a little scary because the, the standard things that I had always been taught is, you know, look at the email address. You know, you can go deeper in and look at the, you know, the various servers it's gone through. But I think like, like we're, we're alluding to here, Mike, every employee needs to be very cognizant of that because... That some of these phishing campaigns now are so so well done that even the best of us will will fall prey to it, and and that can destroy, you know, a, a great deal of work and really really screw up a, a company badly. But both in you know lawsuits and regulatory fines, but but also uh, you know shareholder equity, reputation, brand, all of that stuff. I mean, all, it, all of it. it it's really bad. So, you know, information governance professionals need to be a key member, 
you know, of that team and help help drive those things. And I, I would suspect, Mike, that MER is probably on, on top of that already and probably already offering uh, training and, and maybe even certifications around that for InfoGov people. Yeah. And well, we don't do certifications, but we, we certainly bring the certification agencies to the conference and to the MER experience. But again, the role of the information governance professional is really about this governance of information. And it's not just about where is it stored and, and how am I preserving it? It's all of these dimensions, these things that you're talking about, Bill, the, the ransomware attacks that come in, the cybersecurity posture, the privacy posture. I would ask a question. Is it the information governance professional's responsibility to be cognizant of the data center patching strategy, the software patching strategy across the organization? Should they be part of the conversation around how servers and, and things are patched or, or do they leave it up to the IT group? I would postulate that the information governance professional has a strong interest in that. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to use these examples just to show that the information governance profession needs to take a much broader view and think of it holistically. All of these things that we're talking about, whether it's data center operations, privacy, cybersecurity, e-discovery, training and education, records management, and, and on and on, data sprawl, data minimization, all the things that you'd be concerned with. If you're not looking at it holistically as one sort of ecosystem, then you're not going to be successful. Yes. Yeah. A great, great point. And I know, I know we're, we're running up near uh, where we're going to need to uh, cut it off here, Mike, but one, one last kind of topic that, that I wanted to at least mention, that's really in the area of information governance with e-discovery litigation support. And I'm sure you've, you've had the same experience and, and probably have the, the, the same opinions as well. But effective information governance is really the key, you know, to, to ensuring a complete and lowest cost e discovery process. You know, and that's that's why on the on the electronic discovery reference model, you know, information governance is is kind of that main point off on the left hand side that says you have to have control of your data to be able to do e discovery co- correctly and at the lowest possible cost. You I, I assume Mike, you agree with that? I do. I do agree with that. Okay. But what I would say, I would say, if we're having honest conversations with ourselves as professionals, if you're an IG person sitting in, in any given company and you're dealing with COVID and you're dealing with the workplace being spread around remotely now, maybe now it's shifting to a everyone can work from wherever they are. If you ask yourself an honest question, do I really have control over my information? Do I really, really know where all that information is? Answer that question honestly, and you might be surprised at the answer. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great kind of level setting question that uh, I think many people need to understand. And it really it really gets down to you know with with all of the stuff we've talked about, you know, not just records management and information governance, but privacy, being able to respond to privacy requests, e discovery, so forth. You have to know what data you have because you can't fully react unless you know what you have. One point I, I always like to, to mention, and that's the DuPont case, because it's so straightforward in, in this, and it ties you know, records management, information management, and, and e-discovery together. And I'll just very quickly go through it. So I, I think it was back in 1999 or 2000, DuPont, very large chemical manufacturing company, lots and lots of lawsuits every year, like, like many large companies. They re-looked at nine cases, nine lawsuits, and, and the e-discovery involved in those nine cases. In going back and looking at those nine cases, they determined that they had reviewed a total of 75,450,000 pages of content in response to an e-discovery request, uh, again, uh, across those nine things. A total of 11, 000, or 11 million pages or there, thereabouts turned out to be responsive to the cases. So 11 million out of 75 million. DuPont also looked at the status of the 75 million pages of content to determine the status of the records management, their records management process. And they found that 
approximately 50% of those 75 million pages of content were beyond their documented retention period and should have been destroyed well before. So they ended up basically having to review page by page, you know, 36, 37 million pages of documents that should not have existed anymore. They calculated, they spent almost $12 million reviewing those 36, 37 million pages of documents that should not have existed. So they, they actually spent about $12 million because the data that they had marked, the files that they had marked as being expired, wasn't actually gotten rid of. And in discovery, like, you know, Mike, anything is discoverable. If it exists, if it exists, you, you can't you can't say, well, gee, that's expired. We don't have to show it to you. No, if it if it exists anywhere, the discovery has to go find it and has to spend the money to review it to determine whether it's discoverable or not. And uh, that that's that's where information governance comes in with with e discovery. And and I've done podcasts on this. I know Mike, we've talked about this, and you've written stuff around it. The whole idea of of data minimization, data defensible disposition. Get rid of stuff you no longer lead. That's part of the information governance process as well. Right. Well, I think the paradigm has shifted. And again, reimagining IG, right? I think the paradigm has shifted. It used to be that you would be afraid you'd be get you that you would get in trouble for not having something that you should have. Yes. And the paradigm has shifted now. It's more likely that you're going to get in trouble for having something that you shouldn't have. That, that smoking gun will emerge. <laughs> and, and I think that's the paradigm shift again back to how do you look at the, the governance of information in your organization? Data minimization is a big part of it. Yeah, and, and that's, that, that's a big, big point I, I have discussions with, with potential clients with is data archiving is not capturing data and keeping it forever. It's managing it. And that includes defensible disposition, getting rid of stuff that you don't have to keep by law, there's no regulatory reason to keep it, and there's no value to it to the business anymore. Get rid of it. And I know, uh, you know, everybody in the, in the information governance community understands that and, and, and I would assume agrees with it. So with that, Mike, I think, I think that wraps up this edition of the Information Management 360 podcast. I really want to thank you for this really insightful and, and, and enjoyable discussion on this timely subject and, and the changing information governance environment. I thought it was, I, I think we got into some points that were really above and beyond, and I, I really got a lot out of it. Well, thank you, Bill. Thanks for having me. I really Yeah, no, that was, that was great, Mike. It was great great uh, discussion. So if anyone has questions on this topic or would like to talk to a subject matter expert, you know, please send an email to Archive360 mentioning this podcast to info at Archive360.com. We'll get back to you just as soon as possible. Mike, do you want to also uh, give a uh, channel that they can communicate and send questions to you at? Certainly. If you want to learn more about the MER conference or MER in general, go to merconference.com. And there are, there are contact uh, points on that website. And if you need to, if you want to reach me, you can reach me through merconference.com. And keep looking at the MER organization. I, with Archive360, will be doing a uh, webinar for MER, I think at the end of this month, Mike. We will we will put links and announcements on on uh, our page uh, so you can uh, you can sign up for it. Also, check back with with us on the Archive Three Hundred and Sixty Resources page for new podcasts with leading industry experts like like Mike on a regular basis. And with that, we will close it out again. Thank you very much, Mike. It was it was fantastic. Look forward to more. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on the Information Management 360 podcast, brought to you by Archive 360, trusted by organizations worldwide to manage their data in their cloud under their control. To subscribe to our show or to find out how you can address today's challenges in information management, visit archive360.com forward slash podcasts.